Today is the Thursday of the second week of Lent here in Streaky Bay, Australia. And the epistle is taken from Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 17. Thus says the Lord God, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like tamarick in the desert, and he shall not see what good shall come, but he shall dwell in dryness in the desert, in a salt land, and not inhabit it. Blessed be the man that trusteth in the Lord, and the Lord shall be his confidence. And he shall be as a tree that is planted by the waters, that spreadeth out its roots towards moisture, and it shall not fear when the heat cometh. And the leaf thereof shall be green, and in the time of drought it shall not be solicitous, neither shall it cease at any time to bring forth fruit. The heart is perverse above all things, and unsearchable. Who can know it? I am the Lord who searches the heart, and proves the reins, who give to everyone according to his way, and according to the fruit of his devices, saith the Lord Almighty. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke chapter 16. At that time Jesus said to the Pharisees, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and feasted sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who lay at his gate full of sores, desiring to be filled with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, and no one did give him. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and he was buried in hell. And lifting up his eyes when he was in torments, he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his, in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I, I, I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said to him, Son, remember that thou didst receive good things in thy lifetime, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a fixed, a great chaos, and that they who would pass from hence to you cannot, nor from thence come hither. And he said, Then, Father, I beseech thee that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, <clears throat> that he might testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torments. And Abraham said to him, They are Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will do penance. And he said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if one rise again from the dead. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <coughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's a joy to be here from uh, Kentucky, where we have Our Lady of Mount Carmel Seminary, with about seven, ten seminarians and brothers. It's about five years old now, and we've had up to thirteen in the past. And it's normal in the seminary that come many come and go, but do pray for them. And, and all the brothers as well. And pray for us in this um, time of the battle of the church for the faith. We were warned by the Blessed Virgin Mary at La Salette and at Fatima. She warned the apostasy. We are living that now. 
And the apostasy was already rumbling in the time of St. Pius X, when the modernists, like parasites and amoebas, got into the intestines of the church. And they tried to infiltrate from within with the poisonous ideas of modernism, such as attacking scripture, attacking Jesus Christ himself, saying that he was just a man, and that his miracles were exaggerated and just meditations of the apostles. And, and uh, Adam and Eve was just a myth, and the days of creation, and Noah's Ark was all just a myth, and Jonah being swallowed by the whale was just a story. And all these attacks, and the modernists don't stop there, they attack the very divinity of Christ, <clears throat> and they attack all the sacraments, one by one they attack the sacraments. And with the Mass, they say, well, the, the priesthood and the sacrificial nature of the Mass developed later, 200 years after Christ, <clears throat> 300 years after Christ. And these are all blasphemies, direct attacks against the very Scripture and Catholic tradition. And if anyone gets, these, gets this infection in their minds, they lose the faith. They lose the faith. In the United States, there's been many mothers, many fathers who have come <clears throat> and said, You know, Father, we sent our child to the Catholic school, we sent our child to the Catholic college, and they come back having lost the faith. And usually when you scratch why, it's because they had a priest who was teaching them that Adam and Eve was a myth that the scriptures cannot be reliable as a historical document, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and this all modernism. That's why St. Pius X, a hundred years ago, had to hammer them and condemn them, because it's, 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 it's not one attack, such as Arius, the priest in the 300s, he attacked one doctrine, the divinity of Christ. But, but modernism attacks everything, the whole body from head to foot, the whole tree from the top of the branches to the roots. And that's why St. Pius X rallied the bishops, rallied all Catholics to fight this terrible heresy, the synthesis of all heresies, which is modernism. <clears throat> and that explains why the Catholic Church is in the state she is in now. Because modernism has infected all the way up to the mind of the popes. All these last five popes have been infiltrated, poisoned by modernism. The ecumenism, the Buddhists, the Anglicans, Muslims, pulling together to pray with Pope John Paul II in 1986 in Assisi, and then uh, Pope Benedict XVI, I think in 1990, or around there, 90, no, the year 2000, he held the big Assisi meeting in 1999 with an atheist, and that was Pope Benedict. And then Pope Francis, of course, has already had the horrible, scandalous ecumenical meetings with the Lutherans in Sweden, and many ecumenical meetings with the Jews and so forth. All this shows they've lost the faith. Their popes, they hold the throne, but they've lost the faith, and they are destroying the church. And we got to pray for their conversion. Caiaphas, the high priest, had the living God in front of him when Christ was arrested on Thursday night, Holy Thursday night. He stood before him, and Christ acknowledged the authority of Caiaphas. He was the Pope of the Old Testament, the high priest. But Caiaphas lost the faith. They all believed in the coming Redeemer. He had the Redeemer right in front of his eyes. He was well aware of the miracles, well aware of Christ having risen Lazarus from the dead, who was already four days rotting. They were well aware of the other raisings from the dead, the driving out of the devils, and the, the thousands and thousands of miracles that Christ did. He was well aware, he was well informed, and he refused. This was the great sin of the Jews. They refused the Messiah because they didn't want the Messiah 
to come the way he came, which was meek, humble, full of charity, and anger when it comes to offending the rights of God. That's why he drove out the money changers out of the temple. And that made the Jews very mad because they were running the business. And they were very unjust to the poor and to widows. And they were stealing money and property and, uh, and committing all these kinds of crimes. <clears throat> and our Lord exposed them. So our Lord... <clears throat> His church, he promised, will last to the end of the world. The gates of hell will never prevail. And we know this. We're Roman Catholic. We know this. We trust in this. But we also were foretold by Our Lady, by many, many saints, and by Scripture, that we will, there will be a time of apostasy in the church. And the apostasy will go right to the very top. And the Freemasons also. Pope Pius IX and Pope Leo XIII, they wanted all the, the secret letters and the secret plans of the, the Masonic Jews to be exposed to the whole world. And the Alta Vendita, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, that Father Fehi speaks often a lot, and Archbishop Lefebvre used to talk a lot about. All these things show their intention and conspiracy to get within the seminaries into the church into the very bowels of the Catholic Church and, and corrupt her from within overtake her from within and they did this when? at Vatican II it, it triumphed at Vatican II and the Freemasons have said this many times the Masonic Lodge Masters Grand Masters in France and throughout Italy they said we triumphed at Vatican II. John Paul II, John the Twenty-Third, and Paul the Sixth were our popes because they promote our ideas. And that's exactly what's, what Our Lady foretold. So this is why we are having Mass here <laughs> and not your local parish church wherever your nearest town is. And this is why we have to stand with the Catholic resistance just to stay Roman Catholic. We are Roman Catholic. That's it. We don't want to be part of this conciliar church with a new mass, new sacraments, new theology, new priesthood, new rites, new rosary, new scapular, new everything. That's not the religion of our Lord Jesus Christ and it breaks clearly and loudly against all of tradition. And on top of that, all the popes of the last 400 years have condemned these very errors that Vatican II promotes. The false religious liberty, which uncrowns Christ as king, ecumenism, collegiality, which is democracy in the church, the changing of the mass. And how many Catholics 50 years ago said, well, yeah, that makes sense. We should have a mass in English. In the, in the vernacular so we can understand it because we're modern man and we're democ democratic now so people really believed that we're evolving and so truth should evolve and the mass should also evolve and one of the most deadly heresies and errors that most of us are affected with the whole modern world is affected with since the middle of the 1800s has been evolution the idea that everything's changing always for the better, and the idea that doctrine has to change, dogma must change, the Pope must change, the Church must change, the Mass must change. And that's false. It's false. The Scripture says, I am God. I am the Lord God. In Micaiah chapter 5, I think it is. I am God, and I do not change. And St. Paul will say, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. He's always king. He's always God. He's always one with the Father and the Holy Ghost. He's always brilliant and glorious and beautiful and good and merciful and just. And he, the, our Catholic faith is the victory over the world. 
And we have also the promise of Our Lady that at the end of this apostasy, at the end of this darkness of the Church, which is a punishment from God, which will probably end with physical punishments over the whole world, which are already rumbling with the natural disorders all over the world, there will be a great triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And finally, a Pope will consecrate Russia. And there will be a period of peace of 25 years, says Our Lady Velasala, where Christ will reign again over all governments. And, and according to some of the prophecies, the, there will no, no longer be republics and de de democracies because they don't work anyway. But it will be the resurgence of Catholic kings who will consecrate their countries to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The Heart of Jesus will fly on the flags of nations and the restoration of the kingship of Christ at the social, political and economic level. And this is what made Europe all Catholic at one time. The glory of Christendom, it's called, when there were so many saints and so many cathedrals and churches and monks and nuns that filled. People understood we are on this earth to get to heaven. We're not on this earth to have paradise here. And that's the, 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 the delusion of the atheistic materialism. That we have everything of the body, the bodies are pampered, we have fancy uh, homes and carpets and <clears throat> air condition this, air condition that. That we become a soft people. And with atheistic materialism, men just think this life is it. So, when we see the lives of the saints, we see how clearly they understood this life is only a short hotel stay to get to heaven. And that's why God asked the saints to suffer much, to suffer for souls, to carry the cross with Him, to help Him and Our Lady save souls from hell. And this is what Our Lady of Fatima asked when she appeared and she showed the children hell. So many souls go to hell, she says. And that's 1917. What would it be now? And I think it's St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. She was a Carmelite nun. Our Lord asked her to carry a very strange cross indeed, which was, she saw a place in hell which was called, I think it was called the Lion's Lake, which had the most horrifying devils in it, and a particular suffering in it. And our Lord asked her to go there for five years, on and off for five years, and to, to offer that suffering to save an innumerable amount of souls from hell. She could have refused, but she accepted it. And she went into hell for five years. A strange cross, isn't it? And then look at uh, Sister Josefa Menendez. She would descend into hell many times, for six or seven hours at a time, to suffer for souls. And she describes what she sees, the horrible tortures of the damned, the horrible beasts of the devils. She sees priests in hell. She sees nuns in hell. She sees innumerable souls of all types in hell, cursing their life. And that's why in the Gospel now, we get from our Lord's own lips the story of Lazarus, Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man dies, he goes to hell. He, he feasted on earth, he could have helped Lazarus, he refused to show any charity to this poor beggar. He wouldn't even give him the crumbs off his table. And Lazarus goes to paradise, that is limbo, before Christ opened the gates of heaven, the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man, Dives, goes to hell. And our Lord is telling this story, and we get a real glimpse of the horrors of hell. He's tormented, he's burning, he's dying of thirst, and he knows there's never an end to this. So he asks, please ask Lazarus to, 
to moisten my tongue with a drop of water. And then Abraham, and then Abraham tells him, but Lazarus on earth begged for a crumb and you wouldn't give him a crumb. You had all good things in this life, on this earth, but he had suffered many evils. And now he's in paradise and you go where you would deserve to go. And then he says, uh, the rich man says, but at least go tell him to go tell my brothers. I have five brothers. Tell them. And Abraham responds, but if one went to them from the dead, they would do penance. And he says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if even one rise again from the dead. Now we've got the privilege to have Moses and the prophets. We know Christ was crucified, rose from the dead. We have, we have a lot more on top of all this. We've got all the history of the Catholic Church, which is already miraculous, with millions of martyrs, <coughs> millions of miracles. We have, even in recent times, the miracles of all the incorrupt saints who are ro not rotted, Euchar true Eucharistic miracles. We've got the Tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe, another miracle. NASA did a study on it. They said it cannot be explained, inexplicable. We've got the miracle of, uh, of the Shroud of Turin. And we've got all of Catholic teaching, the infallible authority of the Church, guided by the Holy Ghost. And the authority of the Roman Catholic Church condemns Vatican II already. So we already know what we're supposed to do. We're, we're, we're supposed to reject this false religion of the Vatican II and the New Mass. We have to absolutely reject it. And there's no saving it. And this is a dream of the so-called conservatives, who are truly liberal Catholics. And they're the most dangerous enemies of the Church, said Pope Pius IX, the liberal Catholics, who pretend to try to save Vatican II, who pretend to try to excuse the New Mass, and say that it can nourish your faith even. And that's modernism. It can't nourish your faith. Archbishop Lefebvre said the New Mass corrodes and corrupts and makes you lose the faith. And then the, the even worse, the liberal Catholics go farther. They say, yeah, well, you can have the Latin Mass. The Latin Mass, the Latin Mass, the Latin Mass. But in their minds, they accept Vatican II and the new Mass. And that's the catch with the motu proprio that Bishop Follet should have condemned, and Bishop Williamson, and all the other bishops. They should have condemned the motu proprio. And I'll tell you why. Because the motu proprio... To have the privilege to say the Latin Mass, that priest has to, by authority, zero authority, because it's not from God, but by the, uh, the words of motu proprio, the priest who says the motu proprio Latin Mass has to accept Vatican II and the New Mass. And in the cover letter that Pope Benedict XVI put to the motu proprio, he says very clearly, these are two equal rights of the Catholic Church. New Mass and Old Mass are equal. Blasphemy. That's false. The New Mass comes straight out of hell. It was written with the help of six Protestant ministers, written by a Freemason, uh, Father Bonini, later made a cardinal. And he said it himself. The purpose of the New Mass was to take away everything that displeased the Lutherans and the Protestants. So it's a heretical Mass. And if it's valid, it's even worse, because Christ is subject to this absolute <laughs> blasphemies. And then he also says in the cover letter of Motu Proprio, which is now praised by Bishop Follet and all the new SSPX, and also the false resistance, they all praise it. And Motu Proprio is poison. It says in the cover letter that the priest who says the Latin Mass must also accept and cannot refuse the new Mass. So, motu proprio, that document should have been absolutely rejected by Bishop Fillet. And the four bishops should never have asked Pope Benedict to lift the excommunication. How can you lift something that never existed? And Bishop Fillet tried to persuade the faithful that, you know, it's in the eyes of the world, so that the world thinks we're excommunicated. 
We're just asking to lift that. But then you're playing with a double tongue. You're playing a lie. And God hates the double tongue, says the Holy Ghost. Because the there was no excommunication. There was no suspension. It's null and void. Because you can't excommunicate the traditional Latin Mass, which was canonized by St. Pius V. And he threatens, anyone who dares to change this Mass will incur the anger of Almighty God and the Apostles Peter and Paul. And this Mass, says St. Pius V, goes all the way back to St. Gregory. And St. Gregory the Great says, this Mass comes from the Apostles and from Christ himself. So, you can't excommunicate the Mass. And you can't excommunicate the Catholic Church, which is what these popes tried to do. When they excommunicated Archbishop Lefebvre, which never happened, but when they pretended to, they were trying to excommunicate all of Catholic tradition. But you can't. And even Pope John Paul II spoke frequently, and, John, and Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis, speak often of the new church, of the new advent, of the new Pentecost. But you don't need a new Pentecost. There already was one. The Holy Ghost did a good job with the first one. He doesn't need another one. But Pope Benedict really believed Vatican II was another Pentecost. And that's why he loved the, the Charismatics. He loved them. He thought they were, he really believed they were a new burst of growth in the Catholic Church. And the growth of what? A growth of, a growth of stupidity and ridiculous behavior with barking and crawling on the ground saying that they're moved by the Holy Spirit. When many times it's not the Holy Ghost, it's the devil that possesses these people. You may have heard in our days in, Ridge, in Ridgefield, we had a seminarian that had been with the Salesians. And uh, he had been with, he had also been, before he converted, he had been in other groups. And he had been in the Charismatics also himself. So he met a lady who had left the Charismatics. She had worked for many months and even some years with the Eskimos in Alaska. So she got to learn their language and work with these people. So she, back to the mainland, she ended up joining the Charismatics, Catholic Charismatics, and she was at one of their sessions and one of the people started, I think it was a woman, she started speaking blabbling in tongues and, and they all gathered around her and said, look, She's moved by the Holy Spirit. And she was on the ground, rolling on the ground, babbling all this language. And, she's, and they were saying, look, the Holy Spirit's moving her. And this lady who had worked with the Eskimos, she said, wait a minute. I know that language. None of them knew the Eskimo language, but she, she studied it and she knew it. She said, I know that language. And you know what they're saying? You know what she's saying? She couldn't believe it. She says it was full of blasphemies against our Lord, against the Virgin Mary, against the saints. And she left it. She saw right through it then that this is not from God. And that, so, we are in this age of apostasy. And it's clear what we have to do. We got to do what Archbishop Lefebvre did. And he was a grace for our day. And what did he do? As a bishop, he did his duty. He took care of souls all over the world. He came to Australia, giving confirmation. Coming into other bishops' dioceses, which is like a huge, no trespassing in canon law. You don't do that. But he understood we are in a state of emergency. That the world has fallen to apostasy, and the Catholic faith will be lost. He saw it. And that's why he traveled all over the world. That's why he founded five seminaries. To save the church through the priesthood. That's why he saved the Mass. But the most important thing is he saved the Catholic faith. The real Catholic faith. Not Vatican II nonsense, and not modernist nonsense, but the real Catholic faith of all tradition. The one that condemns modernism, communism, socialism, liberal Catholicism, separation of church and state, freedom of the press, freedom of the speech, freedom of the video, and, and uh, freedom of conscience. All this has been condemned by the church. 
And the Archbishop Lefebvre proclaimed the kingship of Christ. And that's what he said to Rome. The day you proclaim the kingship of Christ, instead of uncrowning him, then we can talk. But until then, well, there can be no discussion until you come back to tradition. And this is what Bishop Fillet should have done. But he hasn't. Now he's seeking an agreement. And now he's, he's already got the agreement, pretty much. There are, the ordinations are recognized. The confessions are recognized. The marriages are now recognized. There are another St. Peter's. Another traditional community, number, I think, 13, that has fallen to compromise. And you've got to pray for the bishops. You've got to pray for the priests, please. We've got to pray for our Holy Father, the Pope. But we cannot follow them. So stand strong in the faith. And stand strong on the shoulders of Archbishop Lefebvre. And what do you do as lay people? Make sure you read. You've got to study. Read They Have Uncrowned Him. Read A Bishop Speaks of Archbishop Lefebvre's series of sermons and talks throughout the 70s. And read also his great conference of 1991, seven months before he died in September, given in Encone, that last conference where he talks about we are in the same fight of all the popes of tradition and we cannot waver, we must not compromise. And that's also why we cannot make excuses for Vatican II in the new Mass. And it's very disappointing that the bishops consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre, all of them have succumbed. And I don't know why, I wish they didn't, they know better when I mean, we got to pray for them, but we cannot follow them in those errors. So that's where God has us now. He has us in the trenches. We've got bullets coming up at us from the Sedificantes. We've got bullets coming at us from the Navasordos. We've got bullets coming at us from the front with the fake resistance. We've got bullets coming at us from the new SSPX. We're right in the trenches with all the bullets falling on us. And that's exactly where God wants us. And we got to fight back with the daily rosary, deepening by good spiritual reading on Archbishop Lefebvre's works, Father Dennis Fahey, the, uh, the counter-revolution that we must be soaked in uh, to fight against the errors of Vatican II and the New Mass. And, and they're not so hard. Try to read Pius XI's Quas Primas on the Kingship of Christ. It's not that difficult, and you'll enjoy it. Read it. Read Pope Leo XIII's Condemnation of Freemasonry. It's not that difficult. It's, it's simple, clear language. He's writing to the bishops, but it's very clear. And then, uh, Pascendi, Condemning of the Modernists, that's, it's tough. That's a tough document, because it goes very philosophical and very metaphysical. But it's written by St. Pius X. And then, um, the encyclicals of the Syllabus of Errors of Pius IX and Quanta Cura, these are not so difficult to read. So I urge you to try to follow these. And try, of course, to stay up to date with the recusant and um, the, what is it, Our Lady of the Southern Cross. That's the paper here in, of the Catholic resistance here in Australia. So, dear faithful here, persevere and stay close to the Virgin Mary. And under her mantle, pray in her rosary with her scapular, you will keep the faith. You will die in, with her mantle over you, if you die with her scapular. She says that. And the church says that in the blessing. She will be there to protect you from the attacks of the ancient serpent, the devil. So persevere, and remember to pray for us, our seminarians also in Boston, Kentucky, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. As we proclaim and continue with God's help to maintain the line and stand of Archbishop Lefebvre with no compromise. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us to every course. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.